everyone. Welcome to the Coach's Journey podcast. It's Alex here. I'm really excited that on today's show, I'm joined by Mark Bixter, who was my lead coach on my coach training way back in 2017 with the Mo Foundation. It was really wonderful to catch up with Mark all these years later to hear about his own journey into coaching, how the work he does um, works with a range of people who we might often not think of the typical client of a coach. Mark talks about how he works with different communities ranging from prisons to those that are often underserved by society and how Mark has created a sustainable, accessible coaching business that aligns with his values. From this, we have a really interesting conversation about how, as coaches, our fees don't necessarily always reflect the value of our work, particularly when we're thinking about um, creating value and working in a values-aligned way. Um, and I think hearing about Mark's experience was also insightful because for me, we often think that or hear that coaches, life coaches, bring that idea of someone who's achieved some sort of harmony or perfect alignment in their lives and worlds. And I think Mark really candidly and eloquently talks about his experiences that are often common with coaches in the sense of we find coaching after a period of personal challenge. And in addition to that, Mark brings in how his experience as an actor previously and a food critic and now as an accredited celebrant all informs his work as a coach and how his work as a coach also informs his ongoing um, work as a celebrant but also other aspects of life and it's really interesting hearing about you know how coaching shows up in all areas of our being so for him talking about relationships and parenting um, which hopefully is, is of interest as well there's some really, really interesting practical parts too that Mark talks about, as well as having a conversation about the interplay between coaching and mental health. Mark shares his own experiences and practical steps for how he went from kind of a part-time coach to a full-time coach and the, the things he did to create more clients for him in that period of transition, and also the things that came about through clients sharing his work. So ranging from uh, the personal story to the practical tips Hopefully, um, you'll enjoy this episode with Mark as much as I did. But without further ado, I'll hand over to my conversation with the wonderful Mark Bixter. Mark Bixter, welcome to the Coach's Journey podcast. Hi, good to be here. Mark, I'm really excited um, for today, in part because you were such an integral part of my steps into coaching as the lead trainer on my Mo Foundation course, and I'm sure we'll talk a bit more about about Mo when we get there. But one of the ways I'd love to start is actually to hear kind of where did you first come across coaching, Mark? Yeah, so I guess my my very first interaction with coaching was I was on a career development program at the National Theatre. Um, how long ago would that have been? Probably fifteen years ago, something like that. And um, as part of that, we we had a coach to kind of help us navigate the program. And I don't I don't even know if I realised they were a coach at that time or that I was being coached. But uh, I know now that's that's what happened. Uh, and and then um, where did where did coaching come in again? I suppose. Uh, later on, I, which I'm sure we'll talk about, I was working for a charity that that delivers coaching um, in the prison system. And whilst I was there, I had a coach, uh, had a coach myself. And then I was very aware that I was I was being coached. Uh, and I was also working for an organisation that that did coaching. And and also where I that's the point where I started training as a coach myself. So it kind of popped up. A couple of times before it became really important to me yeah yeah and i want to catch that you, you mentioned the that first experience of coaching where it's like not as like if you'd asked me then i wouldn't have been aware necessarily that it was coaching how was it on that word sold to you or kind of like um presented at the time uh, well it's it's a good question. It, it they may have said to me oh you're you're going to have these coaching sessions and i uh, and i just sort of blank that word out and thought, oh, I don't know what this is. I'll just go and sit down and have, have this conversation. 
Um, but I do, I do remember it being a very different conversation to one I'd ever had before. And it felt kind of, it felt, I remember sitting there and being asked a question and thinking, oh, yeah, I'm having to, I'm having to think differently here. And I found it, I found it quite difficult actually, um, being coached. And maybe it was partly because I hadn't, I hadn't sort of prepared myself for that conversation and where it was going. But um, at the same time, it it was a really great introduction to how how a, the right question sh- changes your thinking. Mm. And I'm sure we'll we'll come on to more of this as as we as the conversation goes on. And because you do it, I know you do a lot of work with organisations where people can access coaching. So, but yeah, and therefore really curious on that um this potentially being that first kind of conversation where the the right kind of questions can really make a difference how did you uh, being now on both sides how do, how do you what kind of perspective does that give you as someone that's from a better word kind of has access to coaching or is kind of given coaching and then being the coach that provides that through the organization yeah because because i think it's, it's a good question because a lot of a lot of the people who i'm coaching won't won't certainly won't have had coaching before uh, and won't even know what it is they'll have had some vague idea that oh maybe this is something that would be useful and and one of my approaches to that to kind of overcome that as a start is to ask people directly what so you've you've signed up for this service we're here having this conversation what what's your understanding of what coaching is what what do you think it is um you, you you tell me first um and then from there we'll explore it and say yeah I like I like how you thought about that it's really interesting and um and it's been quite good for me hearing those conversations lots of times to help help me mm. redefine and, and mm. think about things and and that also gives a good opportunity to say to move into uh what, what coaching isn't as well mm. and, it, and it I think it's a nice bridge into uh starting that relationship that that it's sort of free of expectation that someone mm. should should know exactly what it is they're coming to yeah and i'm curious what's what sort of response do you get because i imagine you must get a broad range of responses to the more what do you think coaching is I, it varies um most people most people get pretty close mm. you know, if they're having a guess they they will say oh you know i I don't really know what it is, but I think maybe it's going to help me find some direction or help me figure out my own thoughts or or um, it's just going to help me understand what I want to do. And, and, and maybe you'll maybe you'll guide me and occasionally they'll tip into um, giving advice. And then that's often a, a nice way and say, well, it's not quite giving advice. It's mm. we'll work in this way, but we'll do that together and we'll we'll decide how we want this to be. Mm. Um, so it's it is it's it's interesting mm. that for people who and they've got some idea, you know, they've they've signed up to a service and they've probably read a bit on on the website. So mm. they're they're not um they're not completely clueless. Um, they they know we're having a phone call for for a reason that's in in service of them and supporting their growth. Um, but but generally, people get get pretty pretty close to um, to what it is that we're going to be doing. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And, and and this coming from some similar experiences of coaching people who um, receive a service and might kind of get a sense of what coaching is but to your point might think that there's more of an advising aspect how how do you find it unfolds and and for you how do you navigate those moments where it might be quite early on they go they, they kind of get to as far as their thinking goes and go well what do you think mark or what should i do now mark it, what and how how do I handle yeah, that? What, yeah, what's been your experience kind of navigating that? Because I imagine the more you do it, the more practice at kind of like, yeah, holding that in a way that can facilitate the coaching without them going, oh, this isn't what I wanted. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I wish I had an answer to that. <laughs> so it, it, I think it, it depends largely on 
context and, mm. and how it is. And mm. what one approach might be, I don't know. <laughs> Why are you asking me? Let's let's figure it out. Let's, I, I have no idea what, what, mm. what you should be doing, um, but let's find out. Um, and sometimes if if I've got something useful to offer, I'll I'll I'll, I'll bring it in and, mm. and say that. You know, there's a there's a part of as a part of that of being sensitive to what what we're talking about together, where we're actually being direct and and mm. saying what I think is helpful and in service of them. So sometimes um, it it's handled in that way, like mm. in, in, in the in the way that probably a coaching manual says, "Oh, don't don't do that. Keep it, push it all back onto the coach." Um, so. Yeah, I think I think it's it's flexible and, and contextual, and trying to understand what what their intention is in in asking me is it mm. is it because they're genuinely stuck and don't know is is my is my point of view helpful here, or mm. or is it an avoidance of saying what they think is right? Mm. In, in which case, let's let's explore that a bit. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it's really interesting. I think it touched on that where coaching can be quite different because someone is coming to you, but in some ways you, the, the main part of coaching is not being an authority on, on something. Um, uh, but at the same time, but like authority brings credibility. So how do you steward that sort of relationship so that it can be in service? And I really love that point. And it doesn't mean you have to follow the kind of textbook coaching manual approach. But actually, what's going to be greatest service to this person right now? Um, and in some ways, it's just what's honest. If it's, oh, I haven't got the foggiest, let's work it out together. Um, yeah, I really love that. Um, I think there's something quite freeing in that as well. I mean, it might, it, it, it may take some people aback a little bit of what I thought you were supposed to figure this all out, but that it can support that, that co creation of, oh, you don't yeah. know either. All right, then let's. Let's be curious about it together, mm. um, which can open up opportunity. Yeah, yeah, and and I think touched on the fact that often the coach you mentioned earlier. Sometimes you might talk about what coach isn't, and I think that term coach can be so broad because the way you took describe it, then I think of thinking partner, which is maybe something that comes out from Nancy Klein's work. And um, yeah, I'm curious in how you then talk about coaching. Uh, to what extent do you balance defining it in the negative of coaching isn't versus what coach is? Um, I, I don't think I. I'm probably quite quite light touch on that, mm. and it's it it's probably more where there's a sense that someone mm. thinks they're coming to an advice service, and they think mm. I'm going to be saying. Right. What, what we need to be doing here is you need to go and speak to this person or, or, or go and do this. So I tend to be very direct and clear of saying saying that. What, I, I really like what you've said about finding a path and, and uh, getting clarity in yourself. And the, the other side of that is what it isn't, is it's an advice service. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm not here to um, say you should be doing this, you should be doing that. It's more a collaborative conversation where mm. we we will figure it out together. So I don't I don't kind of go into a big uh, academic polemic about what where coaching ends and, and and what we mustn't possibly do in this in this environment. But um, but just really clarify that, which means if you do get that question of what do you think I should do, can, can you give me some advice here? We've we've spoken about that's not that's not what we're here to do. Mm. Um, yeah, mm. yeah. I I feel like we'll we'll probably pick up on this in, in a bit, Mark. Because one question really interesting, I think we can explore is that how then in working as a coach, do you balance being a coach in that coaching context, but also there's definitely a way of being that coaching involves that then can slip into other parts of life um actually i mean it, it's all coming up now how has coaching maybe changed or influenced or affected the ways that you are in other relationships or other aspects of life 
Yeah, I, I I think I've I've probably changed quite a lot since since doing coach training in terms of um in terms of my listening. Um certainly in terms of how how I tune into what other people are saying or or not saying. I think it's kind of strengthened my ability to have those conversations. I notice it with with friends now, you know, if we're just out socially kind of how I not not that I'm coaching them, but how I how I hold the conversation with with curiosity. Mm. Um, so I think there's quite a quite a shift there. It's very, I, I guess, where it doesn't <laughs> where it's um, less less helpful is in really close relationships. Uh, you know, with, with family, with with my partner. Like, um, hopefully, I'm I'm doing good listening but it's it's kind of very challenging in those in those sense to actually well to realize I'm not a coach right now I'm something else here I'm a I'm a son or a brother or a uh, a partner um but actually I guess a huge huge shift for me is uh, I've got a four-year-old little boy and how how I can really step back from telling him what to do or 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 kind of asking him questions around thing and and certainly being patient with him. I think I think in terms of me just sitting back and not getting frustrated and coming from a place of let's try and understand what's going on for you right now, that isn't isn't about me being judgmental, which Seems much easier to do with a child than <laughs> than, mm. a, than a, in a, an adult person, but it's quite. Um, I think it's quite helpful in um, in that relationship of of where where I can be patient, how I can how I can try and understand his thinking and his thoughts, mm. um, and. And in some ways, I kind of I, I don't know if it's questions I've asked him, but. He, I'll find that he is sometimes coaching me. He'll pick up on very like little nuances in my language and say, "But you, you didn't say that. You said this." Or, "What, what do you mean by that?" And like, it's quite like, "Whoa, hold on, mate." Like, um, but he 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 does have this quite an intuitive um, detail to to the nuance of language of if. If, if you've kind of missed a word out of a sentence or you've um, slightly said something wrong, it's kind of challenging on what, what, what do you actually mean there, um, which, is quite, which is quite interesting. Mm. Yeah, yeah, really interesting in um, that when you were talking about it, my first thought was that finding understanding for someone who's in a completely different period of their life and probably navigating like the acquisition of language uh, how they communicate would be quite different so then really interesting thing but actually they're really really good at going oh but I, mean, I imagine they might go dad rather than mark like, what, yeah. what, what did you mean here is a really interesting observation yeah and i i, I wonder like where where he takes that he's he's a, just started school a few weeks ago like in in, in reception and is he is he doing that to his teachers? Like, I think who's this beastly creature that's come into our class, questioning everything we say? Um, I'm sure he doesn't, but it's it it is interesting noticing his it, what he picks up on in language in that way. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and and that I think that broad strand you mentioned of coaching offering the opportunity in non coaching relationships to be able to almost meet friends family individuals where they are with that kind of listening and understanding and going uh, and kind of holding the space even if you're not coaching them yeah yeah and and i i think in some of my friendships now people have learned to expect that whether whether mm. it's because they know i'm a coach or or not but the 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 way i have a conversation might be slightly different to how they if and it elsewhere and being very conscious to um give give people space to um 
tell me what's going on for them to sh- to share their um, story. And I think in in a sense, I've of, I've often been quite. I'm not closed. I think I'm quite open generally, but I don't always share my my point of view. I don't think that's that's not since that's not being a coach. Maybe that's one of the things that attracted me to coaching because I I didn't have to I was like <laughs> didn't have to have a solid opinion. I just had to be curious about the other person. So that was a an easy bit of of coaching for me to mm. to embody. But um but I, I, I guess I don't always feel the need to do all the talking in mm. those relationships, and I can, I can gain as much from um, an interaction when I haven't shared much about myself. Um, and I think, I think there's some good. There's potentially something interesting in that, in in um, how coaching skills can be useful for introverts in. Um, in um kind of social situations where they where they they worry and actually if you can ask a couple of good questions that the other person will probably talk to you for a bit and you'll be okay and you'll you'll have absorbed all this Mm. um so i i don't know there's there's possibly something in that Mm. yeah and almost the idea that good conversation doesn't have to or meaningful conversation with with people doesn't have to be equal amounts of talking from either mm. either party um mm. yeah that's a relief for my next social situation where I yeah. can, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. just have a couple of questions that's all you need yeah yeah and bringing it back you mentioned so your first interaction uh, with a coach was doing some training for the national theater then you need to have a coach so what if we if they're sort of the 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 dots let's kind of fill them in a bit so what was the journey from the national theater to kind of your next real interaction to coaching and coaching training yeah so i guess the the full story goes um many years ago i originally trained as an actor i went to drama Mm -hmm. school um i was an actor for about seven years Mm -hmm. and um then hit a point where I got quite frustrated by by that world. Um, n- not frustrated by acting. I, d- I don't think I ever fell out of love with acting, but I, I did fall out of love with being an actor and the, the challenge that that, um, that that lifestyle brings in terms of how how much of your time you're do- you're unless you're very successful in in doing doing work that you you don't care about or that you're not invested in to try and um to try and spend a good portion of your life doing this thing that is so important to you and 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 that you really love Mm. and for a while though those those scales were okay you know if i was doing three or four months acting a year that that filled my cup that i i could cope with doing Mm. all the other months of doing some some mundane work that I wasn't. There comes a point after a few years where you're like, hold on, I'm spending a lot of my life doing things that are not uh, bringing me joy or pleasure. Mm. Um, uh, they're not fulfilling me in in any way. So so there's a shift. And that's that's when I signed up for this career development program with the National Theatre called, called Step Change. And um, moved then from acting through that program into producing. Um, so I became a theatre producer for a while. Um, I worked on some festivals. I put on an opera in a warehouse in Peckham. Um, put on some theatre festivals. Put on some big events and plays. Um, so quite quite an exciting time. Feeling quite connected to to that world still, um, without without being an actor. Um, and that. That felt quite energizing at that time. It felt like, yes, I found this thing now that um that that works for me. Um and then the next the next step from there was um a a colleague who had worked with uh, a theater festival had, had moved jobs and was working for a criminal justice charity. Mm. And he uh he said, Oh, I've got I've got some 
bits of work if you've got some time to to come and do. And I I, I went and started doing some some bits of admin there. Um, and then moved into a role there looking after arts projects within the criminal justice mm. charity. So designing um designing creative projects for people who have been in prison or involved in the criminal justice system in some way. Um, so that could have been a music project, a theatre project, spoken word. Um, so creating all these things as a, as a tool of um, self-development and, and confidence building in, in these young men. And my role at that charity over time became less and less about the arts, that kind of I became more and more senior. Uh, so I became head of operations. And that kind of took me into career number three, <laughs> which was uh, senior leadership in, in the charity sector, um, small charities. And I moved from, from there into the role of managing director at a charity called Spark Inside. And Spark Inside run a life coaching program within the prison system. And this is where coaching really came into my life in a in a much bigger way. Um, that's where I got got a coach uh, that I mentioned earlier and was kind of, okay, now, now I'm formally in a coaching relationship and I know I am. <laughs> um, and it was whilst I was doing that role that um, I did some coach training. Um, you know, I was kind of managing director of this organization and I, I wasn't planning to become a coach, but I was planning to understand the work that the charity mm. did um, and have a deeper understanding. And and so I did the MO course. Um, and, and that was quite a profound moment for me doing 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 the MO course. I I really, really enjoyed the learning and came to discover that I enjoyed coaching, um, that I had some skill at it, but probably more importantly, it really raised my attention to the fact that I wasn't happy in my job. Um, I, I I wasn't at my best in that role. It wasn't playing to my strengths. I, I was kind of struggling to deliver in it. It had been quite a step up. And, and my mental health really really suffered at that time and um so i took the decision to leave that job um just just after doing this coach training with nothing to go to like empty diary just mm. to, to to sort of refresh for myself and that's where i kind of decided started to coach informally at first just mm. kind of picking up bits after having done that training and, and where my own coaching journey became as part of my own um my own uh income part of part of what what I did um and then I spent uh, I, I took a, a, a different more junior role in a charity for uh um a period of time so I was working part-time and, and coaching um then built that built that up and then in 2020 I went fully freelance as a coach um Partly, partly because my uh, little boy had just gone to nursery at that time. We were creating a more flexible uh, working patterns and, and what was what was affordable childcare wise, and, and there the coaching began. So, <laughs> mm. wow, Mark, um, lo- loads of things come come to my mind there. I think one of one of them I'll, I want to catch pick up on maybe in a bit is that. Um, yeah, post mo, post spark inside that informal coaching, picking up informal coaching bits. Mm. Imagine there's there's lots there, and I know that lots of people listen. Comes the coach's journey podcast, really going like, what well, what are those little things that can slowly build momentum? So perhaps we'll come back to that. But the the thing that you would love to, to touch on first is what what first you kind of influences transition from. A kind of creative arts space to to charity um because it's that that sounds like one kind of big 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 step in terms of while well, what you were doing might felt feel similar the space in which you're doing it is, might maybe different um the way you asked that question made it sound like an intentional <laughs> uh, 
decision that I made of right, this is this is what's going to happen next. It was it it was a lot more informal than that. That I um I was freelancing as um as a producer doing doing bits of work and um I was at a friend's wedding and and this colleague was there who who sort of said, Hey, I've got a bit of work going on over here in this in, in the criminal justice charity if you've got some time like to come and help. And I was like, yeah, I'll come do that for a bit. Um, and it became, it, it was kind of an organic process then. I kind of went in through through a, a kind of bit of administration, a bit of artsy work um, that, yeah, which is probably some of the, probably in, in hindsight where some of the issues came that I didn't I didn't like set out to do that I I became quite reliable and quite good at what I was doing I think and so I became a general manager and then I became a head of operations that I just um picked up these skills along the way but it it wasn't it it wasn't a kind of an intentional plan of right this is this is what I I want to do next it was more a a drift. Um, that's not to say that I wasn't enjoying it and wasn't valuing it, but it it wasn't it wasn't a um, a concrete choice of this is this is the next stage of my career and this is what I'm going to focus on. Mm. Um, and then as I got more experience in it, I was like, oh yeah, okay, this could be this could be what I what I do now. And where where does where does this take me? Mm. Um, and then then my mental health really suffered and. Um, and I had a reality check. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And, and on that, this sort of pausing on that kind of reality check, firstly, it sounded like it came in part through that MO course you were doing. And for, for those listening, take any opportunity just to expand on MO a bit. So, who or what is MO, Mark? So, yeah, MO, MO Foundation is a um, essentially a, a charity that uh works in a number of ways but at, at its heart is keen to put coaching skills or it came from an idea of putting coaching skills into the heart of communities particularly with young people so there is a, a coaching course that is has been gifted by um carol wilson who um runs her, her own company and runs the course in, in the corporate space and she handed it to mo and said here have have a license to use use my course um for good um and and the start of that was let's equip young people in their communities with with coaching skills let's let's allow them to have these skills that they can then go and use with in all the relationships they hold um and it it it's grown and and developed since there and and now trains lots of lots of coaches all the time and, and still with that same model of those those um coaching skills and often it, it's not just now working with young people it's working with people well how i came into it, people who work in charities that support young people um and, and the net is is wider than that but at its heart mo is about supporting community and and, and encouraging people to have better relationships and better communication and um and that was kind of a nice introduction for me to to coaching to through an organization that was working in that way so mo doesn't actually intend to create loads of coaching in the world it wants people to have the skills that coaching brings so um they're training loads of people every year probably i don't, I don't know what the stats are but i i would say maybe five or ten percent of those people like me go on to actually become a coach and and deliver most of them are just taking the skills into their workplaces or into their mm -hmm. communities um yeah and we'll probably talk about that that transition then into the, into the coaching world a bit more for you mark but what i'm really curious about and it's something that i think is can be common for people well, definitely for people changing careers, but for people that might move into coaching or a sort of more freelance profession, you mentioned that noticing that while doing the Mo course, 
you weren't currently in the in the role you had necessarily playing to all your strengths uh, what what were kind of the things that started to bring that to your attention probably when i took took on that role i i knew it was a stretch um i knew i was going to be you know it was a small charity i was going to be responsible for um operations hr finance um all all those all, all those kind of top level stuff in a team of um I think there were nine of us so it was a it was a small charity where one person was was doing a lot um and i i had some experience of um managing budgets and, and tracking expenditure but all of a sudden i was responsible for financial reporting for the whole organization which i hadn't done before which i was very open about in the interview and it was it was agreed that this is my this is my growth area um and but i i started to find it increasingly difficult when 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 i had joined i was really up for the challenge and i i think i found it hard to harder than i thought to to get the skills at the level that they they needed to be and and i get in in hindsight i get a little bit confused about where it where it started to unravel but through through that my confidence started to dip and i started questioning Mm. everything i was doing what actually what do i know what what am i good at here like okay finance is one bit but can I do anything? Do I have a valid point of view? I'm supposed to be overseeing this organization and I can't even access my own intuition that then became quite a mm. toxic internal spiral of of me really, really struggling. And it was it was the hardest time of my life, actually. And I I mean, I, I, I kind of, I'm quite open about this with people, but I don't. I've never spoken about it in this way publicly. But um, I was really quite severely depressed and um, very anxious. Like it, it, it was a really, a really dark period mm. for me of like really struggling and really struggling to be present in my job be present in in my relationships and you know typical thing I was like I had a a meeting coming up I'd be in the toilets crying and like having panic attacks and like quite quite intense so the 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 signs that something weren't working (laughs) were pretty (laughs) (laughs) they were pretty strong and um and and it was a really really a uh, hard period of of me just finding it hard to to function in the world you know to mm. to to you know i i just i, I didn't want to get up you know all the all, all those kind mm. of um things that people talk about when when they're in the grip of depression mm. and um so the signs were strong that <laughs> it wasn't how quite how it got as bad as it did. I I, I can't make mm-hmm. sense of to this day, but it, it it got there, and and it became clear to me that actually the thing that needed to change was was not doing this role anymore to do something different. Um, and so so I stepped away from it, and, and I, I feel like there's an ongoing. Um, journey of recovery and learning from that but almost as soon as I didn't have the responsibility for that job the I wouldn't say the depression went away but it 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 was pretty quick it was pretty dramatic of like this was the heart of what was what was causing me all this all this questioning and internal Mm. um internal turmoil Mm. and so being free of that and having having a couple of months where I didn't have anything to do that was just just about me recovering gave this amazing opportunity because I just did all this training that was about self awareness and learning and communication mm. and, um, 
I can't remember what question you asked. <laughs> well, I, I think it, you answered beautifully, Mark, and more in that sense of uh, what, what, what did, how did you notice that? Or oh, maybe I'm not really playing to my strengths in what I'm currently doing. Um, and I'm a bit, one of the things you mentioned is that beginning to almost doubt your intuition, which I think we can take massively for granted until we almost second guess every step. And you mentioned stepping away was a big part of that recovery process as for those two months it's almost absorb all you picked up in the Mo training. It was what else helps with that reconnection to intuition? And I particularly ask this, I think, because intuition is such a core part of in coaching. Well, help me. I, re, I think both, so stepping away and then taking that time, but also mm-hmm. you mentioned that that ongoing re- period of recovery journey, what has yeah. helped reconnect that intuition or that kind of internal exposed trust in the, the, the things you do, whether they're big or small, intuition being, I think, an integral aspect of being present as a coach. Yeah, I, I, and I think it, it was partly just starting to do something different. I started coaching, and and then um, because I had all this time, I stayed connected to Mo and started going on the um, trainer trainer pathway to kind of embed those skills and um, and sort of move through the trainer pathway. And I still um, I'm a trainer for Mo now. I um, all these years later, kind of, I'm, I'm still involved um, delivering training courses every so often. And there's something about going back into something and being able to be part of that training course and say, hold on, I've got something to offer here. I've got, like, people are asking me questions and I, I, well, first of all, I can encourage them to find an answer for themselves. Mm. But if, if they don't, I've got some idea how to answer it. And all of a sudden, mm. I was starting to get some confidence back in terms of, oh, I know some stuff. Mm. I um, And that that is really helpful in terms of kind of th- that confidence coming back and, and starting to um, build up from there. I think I, I, I like it. And what I guess from what I've learned from that is before – before that experience, I I would always have said I was like happy go lucky. Like everyone was like, oh yeah, you know, Mark's like oh, he's he's loads of fun. Like all kind of really 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 chilled. And I've never really even thought have thought about my own mental health or because I it never it I'd never needed to. All of a sudden, it was like, where's it gone? Um, and I think what now in hindsight, I when I think particularly about anxiety, which I think is an ongoing conversation I, I have with myself around uh, where anxiety shows up for me. But when I think back, it's I, I've had that since school. Like I can now see like there's there's been a thread of uh, of anxiety that that has run through my life that is that is still with me now but i don't think i don't think um really gets in the way for the most part i just i just it, it, sometimes it's there and i just crack on and do it i mean it it may in making big decisions it may inhibit me in making big changes but in in terms of how i show up in the world it, it it's very low level hi everybody I'm Robbie, I'm the creator and founder of The Coach's Journey, and I've just got one quick thing before we get back to the show. As part of our commitment to keeping episodes like this free so we can support you and coaches like you, we'd like to ask something of you. Wherever you're listening to this show, please click subscribe or follow for The Coach's Journey. That's a free way of supporting the show and helping us continue to support you and other coaches. Thanks in advance for subscribing or following, and if you want to hear about other ways to support The Coach's Journey, then listen all the way to the end of this episode or visit www.thecoachesjourney.com. I keep going off on tangents. So coming back to the Sorry. intuition um, part, I think I think it was part of that journey of starting to then see, okay, uh, there's something here that I I I'm good at. There's something here where I can offer something to the world. There's something where I can add value, where I can 
feel appreciated and and then to start doing that doing that for other people and, and start coaching um outside of that structured training environment and working with people and all of them starting to see see some changes really helped helped with that recovery um and it's it, thinking back on it now it's one of those um one of those beautiful moments of, of an assumption being that a coach has it has their life sorted out you know and I, yeah. I, was, I was just coming out of something really crushing and bruising into this role that was about supporting and and helping other people mm. um from a place where I was I I was still struggling and being able to see how that's possible you know it's not a mm. And a good reminder of it's not it's not about what I know. <laughs> like it's not about me having it all sorted. That yeah. means I I can support other people. So so I guess that that thread of intuition into here I'm starting to see I've got some value and I can add allowed me to build confidence and and yeah it's gone from there. Mm, mm. And I think actually it's a really lovely example that does prove that sort of cliche of help yourself can be to help others sometimes in that ability you know to instantly say oh i'm doing this thing that's really adding value that i'm loving and in part loving because it's being able to support others and uh and also i think touches on that that, that thing that, that that coaching offers in and i, and I think is it is not necessarily articulated often but uh, and i've noticed in coaching sometimes but you can as a coach it is a shared learning journey throughout whatever bits of coaching you're doing and your learning might be different to the clients but in it in its own and it, it touches on that point of yeah you as a coach you don't have to rock up and go well i'm coaching you because i've solved all these things for myself um and but i i mean i, I don't know i whether that'll actually make coaching feel really weird um or, or not quite right or inhuman or that's where the robots take over coaching but um yeah really interesting and mark you talked about big decisions uh when you talked about that thread of anxiety and and, and big decisions and, and made me curious about a, a big decision was and we're jumping ahead a little bit here was to then go full-time as a as a coach go full-time freelance um, in, in 2020 what what was it like making and navigating that decision yeah, it was it was quite quite tough. I I was um at that time I was working for a, a charity called Magic Me. Shout out to Magic Me, who do um really great creative arts projects with um it's an intergenerational arts charity. So they're they're bringing older people and younger people together uh, and using the arts for um to create relationships and, and social cohesion and all the wonderful things that 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 does um so i was working there um and with a with a with a great team and feeling a lot more um in fact that's probably another another um another thing that was really helpful on on building my confidence i i had less responsibility in that role i was doing it part time and that again started to let me see in a new environment oh hold on i i do know some stuff i i, I can deliver and so I I was working there um, three days a week. I was coaching two days a week. And again, there was it, it was a, a big leap because I was I was enjoying I was enjoying that that work. And um I well there were two things really. One one was my partner's maternity leave was coming to an end. My son was about to go into um, nursery and all of a sudden finances start to kind of become really important. And it's like, where are we going to find all the money for, for childcare? How, how are we going to make this this work? And um, after talking about it together, one of the, one of the solutions or, or possible solutions that came out of that was that if he went to the nursery part time, I could do childcare part time, um, but I couldn't work um, just part time in the in the charity financially. So the potential for coaching to increase 
in, earn more money over a short period of time was um, was a, a solution to that. The caveat being that I didn't know where the work was going to come from. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I knew if I didn't create space for the work, I wouldn't be able to do it. So there was there was this sense of, yeah, there's got to be a leap of faith here. I, I've got to. And one of the ways I I did that was part, partly but fi financially, I knew I had some savings. So if if it went really badly after a few months, I I I could then go and find a job again and we could rethink it. But so so I had a bit of a, a, a bit of a buffer zone. And, and I think it was those things that meant, right, let, let's take the leap now. And um and I took the leap. And um, and then there was a global pandemic, so it it felt like, <laughs> oh, okay, I've just sacrificed any any financial stability I had for this freelance um, existence, and and the world shutting down. How how's that going to play out? And I imagine that sort of irony that I'm assuming that there was no childcare provision either at the same time. So yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> an interesting irony in, in terms of. It wasn't too bad because nurse, nurseries rather than, skill, uh, than schools remained open mostly. Mm. So there, there was a shutdown, but it was for it was for about four or five weeks rather than the months that the, the schools were closed. So it was it was less dramatic than had it had it happened at, at school age. But yeah, yeah. But I think firstly something that really stood out for me, Mark, was that. I didn't know where the work was going to come from, but I knew I had to create space for the work to to come, which is, I think is really interesting because it often feels like that chicken and egg dilemma for, I imagine it's in lots of freelance cases, not just coaching, but someone that's doing coaching and something else. Mm. Go, well, I need to build my coaching up to this point before I can do it before, with more time. Yeah, really interesting to almost have that flipped on its head. And pre-pandemic, what were your, what did you expect or anticipate doing with that time to create the work? Yeah, I mean, I I wasn't completely clueless. I had I had some ideas and some um, ads in the fire. So I I'd already begun at that point um, working with Frontline as an associate mm -hmm. coach. So um, Frontline is a, a charity training up um, social workers, so newly qualified social workers, first year on the job, getting some leadership support around how they how they um, handle that. Um, I don't want to miss sell Frontline while we're talking there. They, they've kind of expanded quite a lot now and work at social work at all levels from, from newly qualified through to director of children's services. Um, and coaching is a big, big part of their uh, support that they offer. Um, so I had that. Um, I had that, which wasn't, um, which wasn't loads of, of hours. It was, it, it, it's, um, it's working with people over an academic year. So six sessions over a year. And I, I can't remember how many, I had about 12 coaches. So there was, you know, that's like, whatever the maths is of that. It's only a few, few sessions a year. It's not loads, but th there was, there was some guaranteed income in those two days. Um, I had a, 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 a couple of, private clients so i had some you know I had those those two days were feeling pretty pretty solid that i was already coaching um i had also i'd applied at that time to become uh, a coach with sanctus mm. um who who at the time were um purely doing coaching around mental health within organizations um sanctus has gone through a period of change and offers lo lo lots of different coaching interventions now um greater than that and um and i was i was i really still am i really um really interested in the in that interplay between where coaching can support mental health and and that um where 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 it's coaching and it's not therapy but it's still it's working in that um in that that space um and that partly because of 
my my previous experience, I was so excited about the prospect of of coaching in those in those areas, and probably jumping about a bit. And one of the one of the requirements of Sanctus was that you were you had accreditation with one of the accredi- accreditation bodies, and and I I didn't have accreditation, but I really wanted to work for Sanctus. So it was a it was a um, it was a real kick up the bum for me to to do the accreditation process because mm. um, so I applied for Sanctus and I said it's it, it's my accreditation is in in motion um, so I was going through the the um, the process of being being taken on as a Sanctus coach it there was no guarantee there um, but. I was hopeful that 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 will come off at some point. Um, that was quite a, the, the the onboarding with Sanctus. I think from from the start of my application to doing my first coaching day was probably about a year. Mm. So it, it was quite a protracted um, quite a protracted process. There wasn't there wasn't a guarantee. So I had some ideas of the kind of work I wanted to be doing and, and where I might where I might be finding that. So. That that was kind of enough for me. Plus, having having a bit of financial backup that mm-hmm. if this didn't come off, I'd mm-hmm. I'd be able to pay the mortgage. Um, they, I think, having having those things in place were what allowed me to make that make yeah. that leap. Yeah, we're jumping around a little bit there, Mark, but I'm really curious about that interest you mentioned. Um, that interplay between coaching and mental health mm. and I think obviously that was when you first started the focus of Sanctus's work so it'd be, I'd love to hear and Sanctus and, and Mo and Spark Inside and the Frontline I think you mentioned we'll put all of those organizations in the show show lo- links for anyone who wants to find out more but um jumping around again but what what is your experience of that navigating that interplay between mental health and coaching mm. i suppose there's a for me one of the the starting points is and it, and it's a question when delivering the mo course that comes up all the time where is where is it therapy where where are we teaching and pe- people can be very um can feel very scared or reluctant to go anywhere near something that that could could be classed as a, a something around mental health and the more flippant side of me says it's it's completely nonsense if you if you were to ever say as a coach well i can't if someone's experiencing a challenge with their mental health they can't be coached no one's ever going to have a coach ever because at, at some point everyone's going to have a mm. challenge with with their mental health and um so it it has a role to play to to give people a, a space to to think and explore, and one of the one of the helpful phrases that came from Sanctus when contracting and setting up a relationship with someone was, when you come to a Sanctus coaching session, you can talk about anything. There's n- nothing that you can't bring and, and share in this session. However, we may not be able to work on everything. Mm. And there's a big difference. So someone feels safe to be able to they 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 could come and share um, something particularly traumatic that's happened to them in in their life, and that's helpful to inform the context of how they're showing up. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to we're not we're not going to coach you on that. We're not going to dig into some past trauma. We can have a conversation about where you might want to take that, but we can hold the fact that that's part of your experience. And, and focus on what, what what's happening for you now. Okay, you're feeling you're you're feeling really overwhelmed and stressed at work, and you're um, and there's lots of anxiety coming up for you. That we can we can absolutely have a coaching conversation around. Mm. Um, so that 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 feels really important. Um, and being really clear with with people on where the where that boundary lies and. You know, if something comes up that is not going to sit within a coaching realm, let, let's let's speak about where we can take it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And another thing that I found really helpful in in how to how to kind of sense check where where this where this sits and and whether it's something I I should or could be working on is a, a model that my supervisor um, Marie Fair um, Beyond Partnership a little shout out to Marie there who who has been really instrumental actually in 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 my development and breadth of a coach I I, I feel so um, so supported and lucky to have had the chance to to work with with her and that ongoing work with her um but she she wrote well she's had this idea and she wrote an article around it um called the three c's and if you have three c's in the three c's in place in your coaching you're you you can not really go too far wrong and the three the three c's being um is it contracted for is it competence is it within your competence and client's best interest is it in the client's best interest so have if if you've if you've contracted for it then it's okay to go there in terms of having conversation uh it does my level of competence mean that i can handle this conversation okay then let's explore it some more and if it doesn't right where are you going to go where, where you, maybe you want to take that to therapy or maybe you want to take that to some other um and crucially is it is it in the client's best interest? So I, I'm, we may have contracted for it. We may be, I may be competent in holding the conversation, but is it the conversation we actually need to be having? Hmm. Uh, and so that's that's kind of a really helpful framework that I've often held on to in terms of, okay, some things, some things come up here in this conversation we're having. How do we decide if if we're going to, go into this or or how we're going to manage it mm-hmm. and yeah we'll, we'll link to marie fair as well really enjoy those three seasons i think an invaluable framework regardless of the content of your, your yeah yeah I mean, I mean yeah it's not it's not a it's not a framework in terms to to be specifically applied to working in mental health it's it's a, a structure to kind of apply to your coaching full stop <laughs> yeah yeah and um but also something that jumps out for me as, as well which is possibly the thing that is taken for granted in coaching is the value of of simply listening or someone being heard and, and received and to that point of that sanctus kind of contracting of this is a space where you can bring anything doesn't mean we'll coach on everything um but just the benefit of someone being able to therefore uh, understand where they are and then from which you can use coaching to move forward in the bits that feel appropriate in the coaching space yeah and and obviously there's there's i guess quite rightly a um a what's the word a a principle of coaching that is about people moving forward about people uh about i then finding finding the strategies that help this person move beyond their current position what what is it they need to do to step beyond this this current um place Com- completely completely on board with that um and sometimes it's not always necessary to take the client to that point mm. because what mm what they need to do is sit with someone who can hear where they're at tell you tell you their story tell you this is what this is what i'm finding difficult i've never told anyone this before oh i've said it out loud there you go um and and now and now what we're we're coming to the end of our session now you've told me all that well now i've said it i'm i'm okay to move forward i I don't I don't need a coach <laughs> to do that. I do. I needed to be heard. I needed, and, and I think there's a real. Um, I think there's something quite powerful in that. Just that recognition of um, giving someone a good listening to. You know. <laughs> yeah, and I, I suppose it's that third C again. Is it in the client's best interest? It's, it's yeah. Like, yeah, you've you've heard it. I can put it down, or I can share it, and that's all that was needed. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that and, and that stylistically sits sits quite well with me. I think one of one of my when we talk about the kind of support challenge um continuum, is it a continuum? I don't know, that scale that naturally I can sit in that supportive listening hearing space and I have to I have to work or stay alert to am I bringing challenge here and do should I be bringing more challenge here and um which is you know a, a, a growth area for me and something I just need to keep a check on and, and bring the challenge where necessary at the same time as acknowledging one of my one of my skills and gifts of the coach is is being letting that person be heard and, and creating a space for them to share really openly what what they're experiencing and and I'm ready to receive it whatever it is mm -hmm. really beautiful thing that maybe to pick, I'd love to hear more about Mark in terms of and, and in part picks up what we're talking about almost at the very beginning where you know you're presented with potential client that doesn't necessarily know what coaching is and the coaching manual might tell you not to answer in a certain way but actually to use your, your, your intuition there so just talking now about you know that awareness one of my real strengths as a coach is that supportive listening aspect one of my growth areas is challenge how has your awareness of your coaching and you as a coach evolved over time changed and how do you almost keep keep a track of it as well and, and those growth areas yeah i th i think fundamentally at, at its essence it's probably not changed a huge amount what what has changed is me being kinder to myself mm. and not always trying to do it by the rule book not always holding myself to this account of this is what a coaching session should be um because sometimes a coaching session is not those things it's it's something else and um so i think what what's what's changed for me is is giving myself permission for that that if if we've not got to the end of a session and someone hasn't got a clear next step that they're going to take away and feedback the next time they come to the session and we can talk about what what's happened that's okay has that person has that person taken some value from the conversation we've had mm. and often they come back for the next session something has happened we mm. haven't we haven't agreed it or spoken about it but oh yeah I've, that that sat with me and i've reflected on it so i think um i think a relaxing of myself of what does a process have to look like what does what does coaching look like? And of course, you know, there are all those competencies that ICF have and all those competencies that AC have, and they're all they're all important and they're all valid. And it's not about um it's not about tearing up the rule book, but it it is about what is it about? <laughs> it's about um <laughs> uh well how how can you serve this client in in that time and um and sometimes yeah hearing them let, letting them letting them tell you what's happening for you is is what they what they need and if you try and if if you try too hard to take them into an action that they're not not equipped or ready ready to take because that might be <laughs> what a certain model says it's not it's not in service mm. Yeah, it's, it's almost that the thing a coaching manual never has is the context of the coaching conversation. Um, and mm. that's where we as coaches, I suppose that's why coaching can be so powerful and such a great experience for the coach and the client. We are learning together and, and yeah. experiencing that moment together as well. And so that is a beautiful Carl Jung quote that... Um, I'm probably going to paraphrase. I don't know if you've heard it, but I I, I love it and, and stand by it, which is something like um, know all the theories, master all the techniques, but when you're with another human soul, be just another human soul. And it's just a, I think it's a 
it's a gift of a probably um, mangled quote that I just gave, but the essence of it mm. is there. And I think, I think that's, that's one of the greatest gifts we can be. be, be present with that person as another human being. And that's, that's where the robots can't, can't take over. You know, that's where the AI coaching is, is not going to, um, is not going to serve someone. Yeah. And, and I think also catches what we were talking about at the beginning as well. Of That's almost what you described when you're like, well, coaching's help. I'm paraphrasing and reducing significantly. Coaching's help me be a better listener around friends or family. But again, it's, it's that lens, isn't it? Of it, it has helped me practice more, maybe being a human soul among other human souls. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for making that connection. Uh, it's that's very true. Yeah, yeah. And I think actually, weirdly, harder to do sometimes when you're starting out coaching or coaching a new context where you think I really have to nail these models. Um, mm. Rather, it's sort of like you've got to drive to the road as much as to the laws of the road. Um, uh, that yeah. might not be the safest analogy to offer people. <laughs> <laughs> um, but jumping around and, and bringing it back to the coaching and men mental health, Mark, mm. obviously conversation awareness around mental health is is growing and i think mm -hmm. for the positive largely but what therefore do you maybe see as the role of coaching in people's that support and contributing to people's mental health um i guess partly what what i've just spoken about of of giving giving people that that space to be heard giving people that opportunity to um tell you what what's going on for them and to, to be really compassionately listened to and sometimes that's enough you know sometimes that, that's enough and I think the 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 other side of that is um and possibly particularly with with men um coaching can be the gateway drug to therapy um mm -hmm. and and that there's a there's a real opportunity in that that um, some um, that that men may come to a coach they they, they may be like oh this is a this is a uh, this is a thing that happens in business where I can you know you can go and talk or uh, I I kind of have some idea of what what coaching is so that that allows me to go and start talking and and sometimes people may feel easier about stepping into that space than they than they would into therapy and if and this has happened for me a, a number of times that um we've started to explore things with people and, and started to unpick stuff that people have kind of started to get a, a realization of okay this is maybe what's going on for me this is this is a pattern for me or identifying something that needs a different um a different intervention and then you can say well maybe this is something you want to take to uh, in, into a therapeutic space or or somewhere else so i think it's i think there's a real usefulness in in that of how how it can almost be the bridge for people who um may not have ha have have gone to therapy or may not have sought help Mm -hmm. um, if helps the right word um, earlier, and they find that, and it can be easier to do with with coaching. Uh, and and I suppose for catching someone sooner, you know, even if someone w would end up at therapy, they may not end up there until mm -hmm. things are really bad. But they may mm -hmm. go to a coach and say, oh, "I'm feeling a bit stressed at the moment," and then the the, the conversations opened up, and then it's like well maybe maybe take this over here um mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. there's an interesting that, that point you you mentioned coaching being a gateway and i suppose um sometimes coaching i mean coaching is a space to find solutions and to move forward as we mentioned but actually 
can sometimes forget that it's also that space to be heard and listened to. And so if you, we, we can potentially go to coaching and go like, oh, I am stressed. What can I do to get rid of this stress? And actually, it's not necessarily the doing of something more. Um, it might be doing differently. But there's that that point of listening first, of mm-hmm. disentangling it, and then it could, and then it could be uh, maybe there's some more things that might be better worked out in a therapeutic space. It's like, well, how how could we we do it? But yeah, I think a really interesting point as well of quite often. I think rightfully so, coaching and therapy are held up as different, but understanding how they relate as well, it's definitely isn't always an either or. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and that uh, I notice more and more now people will be coming to coaching and be having therapy. That, that people will use those two things um, at the same time, but for different different things and sometimes there'll be an overlap mm. and there's a, there's always a, a a caution for me there where there is an overlap in in terms of let's be really clear here on what what you're bringing because rightly or wrongly i i don't i wouldn't want to introduce an idea or a concept that is completely in conflict with what therapy is offering um that there's, there's there's a sensitivity that's needed when that happens. I think in, in making sure um, what um, what's being spoken about in those two spaces has has a boundary to it. Yeah. And to continue the theme of jumping around a little, Mark. So so Sanctus was uh, sort of potentially on the horizon mm. when when you took that leap of faith but then that the pandemic came so what what did happen for you then how did you how did you navigate or reorientate when you know, three months into being fully freelance as a coach i'm trying to remember um what the next what what the path was i i think the first the first six months of that year with with lockdown and with nurseries being closed were were quiet for me. I certainly wasn't feeling all those days with with coaching and and that we I came to an agreement with my partner at that time of um look i'm uh, i'm I'm just I'll do all the childcare you you've got a full time job you do that when I have a session then which when when weren't loads at that point you you know you you just have a pause on work and of course workplaces were were understanding at that point because because they knew so so i i wasn't um i wasn't ever losing out on on coaching work through that time um i was able to do what what was coming in um so i had frontline i had i had some um private clients i was Oh, I know, I know actually what um so Spark Inside, who I um mentioned that 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 was where I was managing director where I, I left the job. I um I went back to Spark Inside as a coach um a uh, a couple of years later. Um which felt like because I I loved the work Spark Inside do. I, there was never there was never kind of any um my own struggles weren't about weren't about the organization or the work. Um I I just love you know I love what they did so but it, it, there was still a bit of a oh I'm putting myself back into this organization where I had a really difficult time but with a complete with a new identity almost of now I'm a coach I'm not I'm not trying to um, and so I'd started doing some of that work as well so I had these two two associate ships um, what happened obviously in lockdown is prisons were <laughs> as locked down as anywhere right there was no way that that work could um could continue like you, you know it's it, it, working in the prison environment is is really challenging at the best of times but there's no way they're going to let a coach bring covid onto the wing mm-hmm. um you know so so delivery just had to stop but they did a pivot and started working with um they got some funding to work with prison staff 
um, because we could do that. Prison staff could do that in their own time over over Zoom. It didn't require access to prisons. So that opened up a new um, opportunity of work for me in terms of, so I started working with some prison officers um, that was that was really rewarding kind of the other side of the other side of um the fence for, for working with prisons so that that then came in um and over the i think over the summer i got accepted as a sanctus coach and that started towards the end so it just slowly it it was a bit touch and go but it slowly started to build momentum so then i had frontline i had spark inside and i had sanctus and i had some client, private clients, which weren't um, weren't many. I, I, to this day, I, I don't have loads of, of private clients. Um, and then trying to think what came. And at some point, I can't remember exactly when, it might have been roughly the same time, um, Young Women's Trust um, came in. You know, so Young Women's Trust is a, a feminist charity um, supporting young women in England and Wales aged 18 to 30. Um, and it's often often around uh, careers and, and and work, but again, uh, the young women are free to bring whatever. It's not it's not boundaried in that way. Um, and I I got accepted as a coach for them. So and I I think by the end of 2023, all those were in place. So now I have this nice portfolio of work that I could. I could build on and so just just to catch that mark I think it, that's by the end of is that 2020 you mentioned 2023 which is oh yeah, sorry recording, so yeah 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 yeah, yeah no, I just wanted, been, wanted to make sure yeah so by the end of yeah by the end of lockdown year 2020 mm-hmm. I I had those all, all those in place having taken that having taken that leap um so I was I was vindicated, and, uh, and and it was worth it. And uh, and I, I, it turns out I made the right choice, and I didn't then have to go and um, find another job in some other sector. Um, and 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 it was it was happening. You know, this this all of a sudden I was I was a freelance coach, and that's what that's what I was doing. So yeah, and and, and there's just a lot of those all what. It is a large amount of associate stuff you mentioned that have a huge number of pirate clients, but also a lot of them are charities. What draws you to, I suppose, those aspects of, of work, so associateships, but also within kind of third sector as well? Yeah. Um, Sanctus isn't a charity, just as a, you know, Sanctus is a private company, but the others are charities. Um, and what draws me to associateships is an inherent laziness. Um, <laughs> in that if if I'm an associate coach, then um, I'm not constantly having to drum up customers and uh, clients for myself because I've got a pipeline coming from another organisation. So the the more cynical version is is that gives me an easy life. Um, but probably the more important one is 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 a values led, um, uh, a values led approach. And I think one of the things that I cared deeply about when I decided to step into coaching was that it would be um, as accessible as as it could be, and that I would be reaching. Um, the widest range of people that I could and hopefully people who um, wouldn't necessarily have access to coaching otherwise. And and with that in with that intention, with that hope for myself, it will be very, very hard to, to get those clients privately and survive financially. Yeah. So yeah. So for me, in in a way, the two things came together. For me to work with, with the clients that I was keen to work with, um, associateships was was the the clear route to that. Um, and and then, 
yeah, this idea that I, so I guess I, I have a, I think the coaching industry is quite elitist. Uh, can, well, certainly, certainly can be quite elitist. And um, in all, in, in, so, in, in so many ways across the, who, who are the coaches? I mean, they're normally people who've been in high power positions who then decide, right, I'm going to step out of this and, and um, go freelance and probably work in the same circles that I've been working with as in, in employment. Great, completely valid. Um, uh, it's, there's, there's, the, I'm not disparaging that, but it, uh, acknowledging it as a... Then coach training, how, you know, what, Caractive now I think it's like 10, 15 grand or something if you were to do the, 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 the whole certification programme. There's only certain people who, who, who can access that. Um, even even sort of ongoing CPD training courses, you know, like, uh, you know, you could do some short courses for a couple of hundred quid, but for something BT, you're, you're talking a few thousand pounds. And that's, again, I'm not in, in, I'm not in any way saying that they shouldn't be charging that amount, but there, there is a structure in place that means it would be very difficult for someone to... Uh, become a coach in, in a in a financially viable way that doesn't in, in, in require some financial thing. which is why Mo is incredible because they um, uh, the training is either provided very subsidized um, to to the market rate um, or places are gifted to people so they can they can get some some coach training free of charge um and what an amazing what an amazing thing is where where else is is that offer happening and so for me um you know there are people who are working in those corporate spaces and, and charging hundreds of pounds um hundreds of pounds an hour and and and, and rightly so you know i'm again I, i'm every time i say this i'm being cautious that i don't sound like I'm being disparaging of that work. I think it's 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 good work and it's important. But at the same time, who's being missed? Who is not uh who's not getting a coach? And 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 for me, um I'm I'm more motivated by um the young single mom who's struggling to find and identify her strengths and a career for herself than I am uh, a C-suite person trying to crack the American market or double their Q3 sales. Right? And again, I'm not, that, that's, that's what is, that's what's important to me. Mm. Um, and of course there is a, uh, there's a cost to that. Financially, to me, like what well, there's there's an earning there's a, there's an earnings cap to to doing the work I do, which I'm I'm um, would I love to be charging like five hundred pounds an hour? Um, yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, but would would I want to be prioritizing that over over making sure I was working with people who? Um, I'm keen to work with, pro- probably not, and, and I think there's an ongoing battle for me there of figuring out how how to manage those those two things. Um, but there is a with that comes comes the frustration around some of the language in the coaching world around know your worth, you know, really charge, you know, how much you're charging, you should double it, um, uh, and. And for me, there is a huge difference between knowing your worth and what you get paid. Like I, I, in in my more confident, bullish version of myself, I can say, "Yeah, I'm worth five hundred pounds an hour. I do really good work. I that that is that is my worth." Um, do I get paid that? Mm-hmm. Never. 
Um, but that's not that's not uh, a comment on on the worth of the coaching. That that is the choices I've made in the sectors that um, I'm working in. A charity just couldn't afford to pay a coach five hundred pounds an hour, <laughs> um, and and I think there's a there's a greater dialogue to be had in in the coaching community um, around who who is not being served mm. through coaching and and how I have no no answers to this at all but mm. like how how can we how can some young man who I meet in prison who has got bags of potential and so such great insights so much to offer the world how can he where's his journey to being a coach and and if he was coaching the c-suite in mm. a big law firm how amazing would that be like how what what could what could um that partner in that law firm learn from from that guy um so there's i think there's there's, there's loads of opportunity there that maybe isn't being tapped into mm. got my soap uh, there a bit didn't i oh uh, uh, mark it was there's so much there i think <laughs> that but the, the bit and i'll probably sound cliche here but that really struck me in that knowing your worth and knowing kind of what you're paid as separate things it mm. really, feels really important and particularly in the coaching industry where particularly among coaches it can feel like this bubble of why well, you're as good as the amount you charge for your coaching which which actually to, to a point you made earlier around probably your best work is the work that most aligns with your values and arguably there's a richness here that cannot be qualified quantified by how much you charge for your coaching and arguably if what you earn will sustain the most powerful work you can do or most impactful work you can do that sounds like that probably is going to create the greatest impact for for the people that or you'll be of greatest service to yeah and and i think you just articulated something that i probably didn't so well when i was talking of that almost what what's what's the rate you're charging what's the most senior person who you coach like and if you're charging loads of money and you're coaching really senior you that's that's the gold standard mm. for a for a good coach that's if you're doing that you've you're really um you're really hitting it and uh, and of course that's really again that's that's really great that that work is happening and and people yeah. should be charging those those fees when they're working in in those places you know if a I, don't, I keep using a law firm as an example. And that's nothing against law firms, but you know, if that law firm's billing that client out at seven hundred and fifty pounds an hour, then then the coach is worth seven hundred and fifty pounds an hour to work with that client. That's yeah. that's cool, right? That's um, but the inherent assumption that that means that's the best, and I don't even know if it is an inherent assumption, but that 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 idea that when that's happening that's that's the real that's the real good coaching um because because the person's senior and and the fee is high when some of the coaches i meet going into a prison and working in in that environment boy do you have to be flexible and dynamic and be able to work in a in a in a really engaging way to do that work and and i would love those kind of um those interventions those were to be thought of in the same way like wow look at that coach he's just he's just gone into this violent prison and spent an hour with this young man in in a room and how how incredible is that and what's the and also, possibly, well, what's the potential financial impact to the world yeah. that if that you know if if it's costing hundred thousand pounds a year to keep him locked in a cell and he comes out and changes the world, like the the, the return on investment is huge. Yeah. <laughs> um, and 
so it, I, I don't, I don't, and I've, I'm maybe over the pudding. I don't, I'm, I'm not pitting one against the other as one good, one bad, but it's how, how, do, how does the coaching industry hold mm-hmm. all those kinds of work with, with intrinsic value and recognize and acknowledge that there is really good work happening and it's not just in the boardroom. Mm. Yeah. And I, I never thought I'd be paraphrasing Spider-Man on an episode of the Coach <laughs> Journey, but it does feel that as coaches, there's a, and this is my reflection uh, or, or, or feeling at the moment, is like coaching is a really powerful, transformative skill and tool and kind of with great power comes great responsibility. That, that's my paraphrase. But uh, there, there's, there's almost an, inherently something that feels important for social justice. And it's like, well, if it's a tool for unlocking potential, it shouldn't be limited to those that can pay an incredibly large amount of money relative to others for mm-hmm. it. Because everyone has some potential and it's not necessarily a fault of theirs that means that they haven't had the space or opportunity to express or explore that and and then there's this challenge though of the coaching industry of well how do do we create the opportunities for coaches to sustainably work in the spaces where access to coaching is more limited because there is less resource for the end user to be able to, to deliver that which yeah i think is a really interesting challenged and to your point a really huge opportunity both in terms of the difference it could make in within the world but also within individuals lives actually probably give a lot more coaches a lot more work yeah 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 and i'm just stepping down off my oh <laughs> my ground i seem to seem to climb there Mark, actually, there's something that also comes out of this that I think is really interesting. I mean, you've sort of said there's inherent laziness that led you to associate coaching kind of programs. But I think that's a really interesting thing. And also, it's allowed you to do the coaching in the spaces you want to do it. Mm-hmm. But it it also highlights that thing of like a coaching business could be what you want it to be as the coach. And so it sounds like there's an acknowledgement that you either didn't want to or don't currently want to give the time to creating private clients. So actually the way to do the thing that you really want to do, coaching, is in working with organizations that can provide you with those clients and you can provide them with the coaching. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And and it's not um and I really the private clients uh I work with I really I really enjoy because again it's a whole different it, it's a, a whole different perspective and I'm often working with people in in the creative industries um partly because of my background and sort of um in in the TV and film and and theater world and, and it's again there's a there's a real joy for me in the uh the mix that 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 comes with being able to to do that I I I could be wrong but I'm probably you know, a coaching day for me could be okay. So, uh, a young woman who's just had a benefits cut and is in a turmoil trying to identify how she can sort her life out. Then, um, then I have a conversation with a social worker thinking about how do, how do I have this difficult conversation? And then, uh, a TV executive thinking about how do I, how do I navigate the next step in my career? Like, what, what an amazing day I have kind of mm. interacting with all all these different people. So it's um it's quite a gift to me that I get get to experience all those things as well. And so I, I think my my private clients are a really important part of of the, the work for me. I just it's just I don't work desperately hard to find them. You know, I I allow them to come organically through word of mouth, through through um, referrals from from other people, and um, and I can do that because I've got I've got the other associate work there. You know, if I was relying solely on on that, I'd be in a mess. <laughs> you know, because because 
um, there are loads of, of private clinics. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Mark, just thinking at that point, there's some questions that members of the Coaches Journey community have asked that would be really curious to, to add in here. Um, we've talked very much about your journey within coaching, but um, uh, on similar themes, actually. So um, Alex, following the Coaches Journey community, and, and Robbie asked, Alex's question was around your experience. You've got a range of experiences in different sectors and organisations. Um, uh, but he noted what one of the things you, you did or do at some did do at some point was you were a food kind of critic or writer or reviewer. Um, and he was really curious how all those experiences inform your coaching. But it feels also worth knowing Robbie's question in there as well, which is he noted that another bit of the work you do is as a celebrant. And it might be helpful to um quickly kind of explain what that involves and what that is. But that too, kind of how does that experience in, in kind of influence your coaching? And I think Robbie put it really nicely in that uh, he he was sort of saying that, you know, one of the reasons people potentially talk to coaches a lot more now is that fewer people talk to pre people like priests who have that sort of pastoral role. Um, but therefore, what what it, what has the experience of, I suppose, being with people on some of the most meaningful days of their lives kind of contributed to your coaching? So that, that has suddenly become a meandering, a very long range mm. of questions. But maybe... A bit more about your role as a celebrant and how that and your other experiences such as the food writing have informed your coaching. So, uh, yeah, for, for clarity, a celebrant is someone who conducts um, ceremonies, <laughs> essentially. Um, and uh, often that's weddings, baby namings, um, also funerals. And, and uh, you could you could create a ceremony around anything that someone wanted to, to celebrate. There was a lovely series that Grace and Perry did around rituals a while ago and the, the, there was a celebrant on that who created a, a divorce ceremony for a couple and um, so in in the potential for what you create a, a ceremony around is 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 vast but at, at its heart you're 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 generally looking at weddings baby namings funerals they're the, they're the kind um, I don't do funerals um, I've not trained as a funeral celebrant um, not not for any reason other than the logistics of that are a turn turnaround for a funeral is it's pretty quick you know um you get the phone call and, and the funeral's two weeks on tuesday and you need to be available then and and how how my coaching works the chances of me being available two weeks on tuesday are are, are nil so whereas with weddings baby names you normally know generally they're often they're at the weekends anyway and um and you know six months in advance that, that it's coming so that that's right i guess um and in terms of how that i think so robbie's question sounded like it was about how how does um how does being with someone on that most important day of their life impact their coaching and i'm i've never thought of it that way around and i'm I'm, I guess I'm going to keep thinking about that. Often the the, the reverse I find is mm. how do my skills as a coach help me be a better celebrant? Mm. And, and that is a connection I've I've often made in terms of um when you're creating a ceremony, you you want to create something as authentic for those people as possible. So you're creating something bespoke for those people that's only going to happen on that day for those people. It's not um, you you you've not got like um, you, you've not got sort of some um, template that you're just slotting names in and then you turn up and read it. You're creating something for those people, and so the the belief going to this that the this client is completely unique to any other client and what is it about them getting married that is important what what does wedding mean to these two people specifically how how do i create something that represents accurately the two of you and what's important to you and 
the way that I I do that is through <laughs> listening and and really hearing what what's important and then representing that in a ceremony. So that that way around, it feels um, really um, really clear. The other way around, I get I guess my initial thoughts off the top of my head are that like often in coaching not not always you're dealing with what is what's not working for someone like they're, they're there because they want something to be different than how it currently is so they may be in a good place but they they want it to be different or they want it to be better or um so the the something about coaching that's that's coming from a place of or or what do we um what's the difference you want to see when when you're at a ceremony you're at the a peak moment in someone's life a day that is going to be represented for them for um for years ahead you know unless they get divorced and have another wedding and um but hopefully that that wedding is still um important to them so there's something about having access to that to people at their most joyous for people at a day that is um the happiest for them and the journey to creating the ceremony is that how is this going to how is this going to be special for you um which is kind of being with people in, in a very different place than you tend to be with people in coaching um and i, I guess there, there there's a there's a parallel in that you're looking for the potential in both both those situations like what how we how are we going to make this uh the best it could be but having that i guess having that perception of people who and some of those people i may be having coaching somewhere else with another coach and they're having very different conversations about their their lives than they are with me as a celebrant because this is all about how do we how do we make this? So I don't know, maybe a bit of a rambly answer to that, but I guess there the, are some of the things that I mm-hmm. see. And to yeah, so the food writing stuff was a kind of it was a uh was something I did, I think in that when did I do that? In prob- probably in the pause when I was um no, I'd done it a bit before then. I I was doing some uh I, I'm a huge food lover love restaurants love eating out um and so it came it was kind of a passion led that I did some food reviewing for a local newspaper and then did some writing for an online magazine um how how does that experience I'm not sure how that experience influences coaching um I'm trying to come up with something and nothing's nothing's like emerging. I think there's something iterative about the collection of different things I've done over, yeah. over time in terms of what what does being in a senior position in a in a, in a charity mean I bring to coaching? What's what's my understanding of the world through that? What yeah. is uh and similarly through acting and, and theatre there's something quite helpful about stepping into another person's world like how do you how do you see you know as an actor you're looking at how do I see the world through this character's eyes why are they doing why are they behaving in the way that they are what is true for them that means that they choose to act in this particular way which is um which I think is quite aligned to to coaching like how how is this person seeing the world how what what's going on for them that that means these are the beliefs they hold and these are the behaviors that they um exhibit and that, and, and there's sometimes a helpful metaphor in in um acting and and in in coaching sessions around how people think and and how people approach things so actors all all have their own process but one one active process maybe i've got to really read this script in great detail i've got to intellectually really get an understanding of what's driving this character what how are they 
how, how are they doing that? And, and if people and if they can't get into that, they find it really hard to to step into the role. And and I think that's the same for a lot of people in life. They kind of have to really, you know, I've got to really understand everything before I can before I can move forward. Another actor might be like, well, I'll learn the lines and when I put the costume on, it'll feel I'll get a sense of what's going on. I'll just start doing it. And and that's another way that people mm. approach tasks. Like I won't I won't sit there and think and try and understand it all. I'll my my process is I will do it. And when I do it, I will know whether it works or it doesn't work or what what I need to change. Um so I think there's something in that maybe that mm. that is is a helpful way for how people behave and operate and yeah. Did, did I answer your question? <laughs> well, I suppose it's a value of submitted questions. Well, we'll never know, but I found it really helpful, uh, really <laughs> insightful um, in that. Yeah, I, I think, well, our two things that stood, stood out for, for me, Mark, is there are some really tangible experiences, some really, some experiences that have made a tangible difference or, or can help you as a coach. But I suppose... Also made me when when you pause and went, I don't know how this food writing maybe does contribute. There's there's two thoughts that come up is one, yes, all our experiences will probably in some way shape how we are as coaches and how we show up. Mm. But also in its simplest way, if we go back to your kind of Carl Jung quote, it is just the a human soul being with a human soul and actually let letting go of a lot of those experiences to be with that other person which actually are potentially sounds like no experience is just as valuable as any experience but mm. that that act, the acting stuff potentially particularly helpful there because of that potential process of considering another person's perspective as a character and getting into character mm. maybe one one thing as i'm thinking about the writing now and it, it might be a stretch it might just be me coming up with something to say but I guess when you're when you're writing something like that, you're very conscious of the language you're using, and you're thinking, is there a, is there a different way I can say this? How how will this be perceived? How will this come across if I if I phrase it in this way? Will it will it sound sarcastic, or will it be met? Will it will it sound humorous in the way I'm intending, or will it just uh, will people not get it? So I guess there's something in being conscious of the language you're using which you um you you would be doing in coaching and doing when you're food writing maybe that's a link i don't know uh, but that's there you go i've I've given it a go yeah no i i think (laughs) i think a good good answer in in that in that point as you say all of these experiences i suppose make us think about how we can integrate them into our coaching and there's one of well how does what I say and how I say it potentially come across and what's the response it elicits? Mm-hmm. Particularly, I suppose, particularly as a coach where I imagine um, other than making someone feel safe, probably not necessarily trying to elicit specific emotional responses mm. in, in what, what we do. Mm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that, yeah, that's, that's true, isn't it? There's, there is a, a difference there in like I I say this because I I'm hoping for a reaction, whereas in in coaching I'm seeking a response, um, but I'm not I'm not hoping for something. I'm inquiring. I'm asking something for, for you to better understand yourself rather than because what I said made you laugh, <laughs> which yeah. which I'm quite which, you know I quite enjoy in a coaching session when 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 we have a laugh and it's one of actually one of my big values is is Mm. fun and i think talking about really um sometimes really hard difficult stuff and um and i I had a session recently with a client who and it was it it was just quite difficult deeply personal challenging stuff they were exploring and 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 i asked at the end how was the how was this today? How did you find that conversation? She said, "Yeah, it was fun," and 
And I was really struck by it. And I kind of checked checked in on that. And and I think the the outcome was similar to where I was coming from. That actually you can you can have these really difficult conversations really deeply, really sincerely. But they you and take them really seriously, but the, the conversation doesn't always have to be serious. I mean, yeah. Mm. yeah. And it feels like it highlights the value of asking a client how they found the session because it quite often will highlight something that we wouldn't think is the case or you know be easy to be self-critical completely missed mm. um i'm conscious we, we talk, i could certainly go on for hours and hours mm. more and we haven't got hours and hours more one one thing that listeners often find really invaluable is some of those practical aspects of how you run your coaching business and i think we've pulled out some of those with the associateship stuff one of the things i think i made a note of earlier is that period from mo into doing more coaching you, you mentioned picking up some informal bits and yeah i'm curious what were the things you were doing that first kind of led you to working with people with with like coaching clients yeah so i think the first thing was telling people that I was I was a coach now owning that title because I think that can feel quite scary for people afterwards to say hey I, I'm a coach now and and so my initial start was it was kind of cheap cheap sessions that I um, offered out for just putting it on Facebook and I started uh, I started coaching friends which you know now when friends come and ask me I say no I that's not uh, I'm not going to be able to do you uh, 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 the best service you, you're best seeing someone else like but um but at the start kind of having a very open conversation with people around you know there's um and I'm, I'm i'm newly drained and uh and uh well, we do already have a relationship so that's that's there in the field but if we're explicit about that and we accept that that's there um you you okay to to go with it so that's kind of where it started really with just just putting it out there and saying hey i'm a, i'm a coach now this is a thing i do who's who's up for it and started coaching with with a few um a few friends and i and then what what one of the other things i went to you know all, all the coaching schools had those days where um they put on a couple of days content and you go and um you go and learn a bit about coaching and then they spend a couple of hours on one of the days giving you a really hard sell on the course but around that they kind of told you, and someone else was talking about this on one of the other podcasts i listened to um can't remember who it was now um anyway, it's, it came up on one of the other uh, other coaches journey podcasts that someone had been and and at the end one of the one of the trainers who'd been running the day i have no intention of signing up for the course it was too expensive i didn't have the funds but i wanted i kind of wanted to go and get the learning and it was mm. it was good for that one of the um they said what what did people take away and someone put their hand up and said i'm, I'm going to get a coach after today for myself and i clocked to there was a room of about 200 people or something and i um and i saw and i paid a beeline for and i like very out of character for me and overconfident and said you just said you want to coach. i've just completed some coach training so i'm i'm new at this i'm i'm learning i'm going to be cheaper than anyone else you ask for if you're up for it shall we would would you like to and she said yeah let's do it and, and i got my first client um who who wasn't who wasn't someone I knew mm. and um and we started we started working together and she thankfully took some value from it and um and she started recommending me and then and then they started to come and it wasn't wasn't loads of people but at the start that that was essentially it it was about um how do how how what are what are the bits that I can I can do here that just get me started? And and approaching that person was was one of them. And then a really powerful thing happened. I did I coached um another friend 
And she, I, you know, you ask for testimonials and all those things, but the, I, I think the thing with testimonials is someone has to find you in the first place to read them, right? And if if they can't find you or they don't find you, they they're never going to know how how good you are. And I had uh, I did some coaching with another friend who, at the end of our sessions, wrote on her own Facebook page. So she wasn't it wasn't on my page. It wasn't a recommendation. She just said, "I've been through this experience and I found it really powerful." And because it was it was on her. It was in her world. It was her sphere. I think people really listened to that. And soon after that, from that one post, I got probably about five clients who who got in touch. And since then, those clients have told them. So that one Facebook post that someone did on their own, not, not on my page, not, not as a recommendation, just saying I've had this experience. I've I've probably had. 20 clients that would not have happened if that Facebook post hadn't happened. And so I've I think as a yes, yeah, sure, get testimonials, but if you can get if if your client feels comfortable to to share with the world that they've had some coaching and who that coach was, to their networks rather than you you telling your network, I coached this person and they thought it was really good, the potential to reach people is 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 really huge so that that was kind of really helpful for me at the start that kind of brought um so much in those early days and then once I had started to get some of that and my coaching hours was going up and my confidence was going up then I started to think oh okay maybe maybe I'm all right and um and then I could start applying for some of the associates because I had some hours um yeah and just uh really hone in on that mark was there anything you did to, other than some re- really great coaching that <laughs> led to to that facebook post from, from this individual i don't think so i don't i don't think i don't think i asked her to do it mm. um, we were friends on facebook so i i saw it and i was like oh that's really nice uh and i i could comment on it but now when when i ask testimonials and I say, you know, these are the different ways. You can just send me something. You could put it here. I say, if you're happy, please, please share your experience on your own social networks. So, like, but there's a direct ask there, and and of course, some people won't won't want to do that, and that's completely fine. But um, for those that do, that's a real reach into so many networks that you're not going to be accessing otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, I mean a really helpful practical thing there, there, Mark. So thank you. Um, we've not got long left, but was there anything that we hadn't touched on that you'd really love to to cover before we close? Um, I don't, I don't think so. Um, no, I think. Oh, I suppose one one thing now I'm thinking after. Partly after this conversation, it brought something back. When we were talking about um, the where where the kind of gold standard of coaching sits, and or, or, or the that sort of corporate world, is for me going forwards. I kind of want to keep training. I want to keep learning. I want to mm-hmm. bring new new skills in. But I'm I guess there's a question for me about how how can I utilize the what i've learned taken from coaching in those um less typical spaces Mm. how what what could i bring from that and take into the corporate space Mm. so that there's something different about my experience that's not someone who was uh uh a partner in in a firm and then went into coaching and they're kind of what what is it that is the difference of me who's been an actor and who worked in charity and who's um uh spoken to people in prison and has done all these things what what does that have to say in the corporate space um and there's not an answer to that but i guess th- this conversation has just raised that for me of thinking where's the opportunity for me to to bring those two together 
in a way that is meaningful, that allows that gets lets me to bring all all the all the learning from and values that I've taken from that and say, how can this be impactful over here with 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 a bank or or with um so you've you've spot that. So I kind of just want to acknowledge that I'm I'm leaving with that with that thought of how I might make that happen. Maybe it feels like a good place to close, Mark, and undoubtedly maybe to tease a future episode when we, we mm. answer that question of mm. how have you and what have you done taking those learnings into mm. other spaces. But I mean Mark, I've run out of paper to school thoughts and ideas that have come from this <laughs> conversation. I've I've really enjoyed it. Um and so so thank you. And um yeah, I hope I, maybe we will talk again in the future on on, on the show. But yeah, yeah it'd be a real pleasure. And I'm sure that people will get a lot of value out of both the practical things but also your your, your journey on the show. So thanks very much, Mark. And thank you. Yeah, I've I've really enjoyed it. And um it's felt really natural. To, to just sit and have the conversation and I'm, I'm really grateful to you for, for allowing the space for that absolute pleasure thank you Mark hi everybody Robbie here and just a few quick things to share with you before you go on to the rest of your day thanks for getting all the way to the end of this episode I'm imagining that means you think the work we're doing is valuable and important and we think so too that's why I want to tell you about a way to support the coach's journey and get coaching from me and be part of an amazing community of coaches that is join the coach's journey community it's my flexible affordable group coaching program for coaches you pay 20 pounds or 100 pounds a month and get access to a certain number of group coaching calls each year plus some one-to-one time with me if you're a full member and various other benefits and of course you get the chance to be connected to other amazing coaches on their own journeys you can join the Coaches Journey community at thecoachesjourney.com slash community. And now's a great time to join. That's because the September call and also the November one are available at the £20 a month level. So you can join at £20 a month, come along to the September or November calls, get some coaching from me of, on, on the kinds of things we've been talking about in this episode. Um, and if it's not right for you, you can cancel any time. That's what makes it flexible and affordable. Um, of course, you might be ready to dive into full membership and I'd love to have you. If you are, we've got a couple of spaces at the moment. You can also become a supporter of the podcast. If you want to give financial support to us, but the community isn't right right now, then that would be an amazing thing for you to do. You can find out more about that at patreon.com slash thecoachesjourney and links for that and the community are in the show notes wherever you're listening. And if neither of those things is right for you right now, please click subscribe or follow wherever you're listening to the podcast. That really makes a difference to us being able to keep this show free. Thanks so much to everyone who has supported The Coach's Journey over the years, but in particular, thank you to Alex Whitten, David Norris, Jessica Jem, Joey Owen, Linda Ransom, Lucy Braun and Ruth Savile for your ongoing support. Thank you too for listening, and we hope to have you back with us on The Coach's Journey podcast sometime soon.